Yo, Ted Barrow in the house. Thank you so much for uh, being down to do this for us. Yo, thank you so yeah, much. My pleasure. Yeah, What's up, man? I was just going to start it off asking, how did you initially get into skateboarding, which kind of led to a lot of your other pursuits and showed you the world around you? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I started skating seriously and like, well, I, I kind of grew up sort of between Texas and California. And so it was always kind of in my life, you know, like kids in my neighborhood in Austin skated. There was a skateboard when I was in Peru in 1986 or 82, excuse me, that I remember skating. I was six years old, but I got serious about it after fourth grade. Fourth grade was kind of like a weird time. And I just was like, I don't, I tried, I started surfing in California that summer. When I got back to Austin, I was like a full fledged skateboarder. So like 10, 11 years old, I think I turned 11, but I like already had a skateboard. So for me, it was always like, <clears throat> escape and identity you know like it was like a way to appropriate another culture like being from texas and like kind of being a weird kid it gave me a little a code and then it also like the sort of, so that's like the cultural aspect of it and then the physical part was just that it's like fun as shit and if you're not like really good at sports or whatever or like don't fit in like in sort of a team mentality it's a really good thing to spend your time doing you know You've been skating for 30 plus years. Yeah. And, uh, you say how like it's it's a way to tap into the fountain of youth. How do you feel about that nowadays in terms of skating? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, um, you definitely have this sort of phys physical and mental um, connection to the activity, which like you're repeating movements and repeating sensations that you experienced for the first time really intensely when you were like 11, 12, 13, right? So in that respect, it is a fountain of youth, but, but at the same time, you also learn, I mean, I think skateboarding, like any sort of activity that you do when you're young, you can't do it forever and you can't do it on the same level and you have to reorient yourself towards it. So you end up, at least for me, like I end up being reminded of my, I'm not like, fuck yeah, I'm killing it. I'm, I'm, I'm still 16, I'm like, damn i'm really fucking middle aged right now and i'm i'm really like you know some of this shit that used to be really easy is a total struggle for me but luckily somehow the feeling of landing stuff that i can still do bad as it may be does take me back to my youth without all the drama of being young you know what i mean like yeah i, I really liked watching the skaters that uh, as they grow older they reinvent themselves and they even just change their from the style of clothes they wear to the st uh, their style of skating, like Jim Greco in specific with his uh, new video projects and like him coming at his age and like impossibling over picnic tables from flat and stuff like that. Or like the slams he'll take are just brutal, man. Yeah. I mean, I like that too. And I think that's kind of the wonderful thing about skateboarding is like, I can only liken it to my own experience and sort of say like, you know, I, I like, we all start out posers, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we all start out, if you're from the East Coast, probably when you started skating, it was some Cali shit, you know? It, it wasn't something that like was like indigenous to New York City or wherever, you know? Like it, it's something that was sort of imported. <clears throat> and I like that you learn a language, there's fashion, there's style, there's tricks, there's like shape of boards, all this shit we care about, graphics. And that all helps to kind of like make us think aesthetically about that. So that like, yeah, when you have someone like Greco, you can sort of trace those different phases, right? Like he had the sort of like, you know, little flannel wearing kid in the Spitfire video talking about like buying pornos, eat, eating saltines to like the Jeremy Klein clone in early birdhouse days. And then it's like this punk shit with Ali Bulala, like wannabe Sid Vicious, Johnny Thunders, like LA hair metal, like all this crazy shit. Like, and now he's like this funny kind of Vince Gallo like Guido mm -hmm. dude still making like amazing like film projects and still pushing himself on a skateboard I think it's incredible I mean it's like it's so corny but it's also so uh inspiring you know yeah, yeah absolutely man I I always bug out about how many different types of skating there are there's like you know you could be like on your on your philly love park like mooney plaza wave you're just wearing like ridiculously baggy clothes and you have a very specific style you could be wearing like you know like the trend the whole transition thing um their style of skating to like like it's just there's no one type of person who does it whereas i know 
at least in like skating is a lot more popular now but before it was like thought in the public eye like maybe you like you just like skinny jean long hair like front 180 down a 17 stair or something like that you know what i mean yeah i like the um i like that at least now i suspect that there are always sort of like different types of skate skaters and different types of skating being done obviously but i think now there's more of a public space for all those things being seen you know like i i speaking of like muni and philly and all that like the sort of like what people call the Kalis cosplay dudes right like i love those dudes right like i think fucking brian panbianco and all the shit he does with those videos is like amazing and i heard him interviewed once last summer and he was talking about he like wants his footage wants the tricks he's doing the spots he's skating to like seamlessly match with the shit from like 1999 like a Kalis part you know from like photosynthesis like he wants that same vibe that same era and in a place like philly like you can almost get that because like you go to philly and the, a lot of those spots are still there it's still gritty as shit in a way that like many parts of at least my experience of manhattan and parts of brooklyn have obviously changed and so there are these what i like to call like unadulterated strains of like a certain style of skating and a certain a group of like skaters who really care ethically about like what sort of tricks should be done how they should be done how you should how you should like be in space how you should skate plazas and all that and i think that shit's really cool you know like i always of course there should be rules i mean of course like rules need to be broken but i also like the really pure expressions of a certain aesthetic like that you know I can like that reminds me of graffiti in a sense because yeah. nowadays um, you see a lot of people coming out with HD videos. Everything's clear and cut, perfect music, everything's perfect. But for some reason, me personally, I can only watch those videos one time. But you know, like iconic movies like State Your Name or Getting Up, like they're filmed with such as like this rugged camcorder that it makes it's more appealing in a way. It brings back the real vibe of what's going on, you know? Yeah, I think that like. Probably, I, I'm really unfamiliar and I'm sorry with like graffiti culture, uh, but like my guess is that if, as you're growing up, like within any culture, like seeing those things was really exciting um, when you're like a teenager, right? And like the technology was sort of limited, you know, like I, I know escape videos from that era, you know, it was like VHS and like very, like this really cr crunchy digital. And so you imagined a lot, you didn't see everything and you sort of like the mind sort of finishes the sentence of the missing words in those in those contexts and like especially with graffiti or especially with like things from that era where it both like is illegal and has to be secretive on some level but also is about like exhibition um that there that tension is like really important to the medium too uh and so yeah like seeing everything and having it sort of like i don't know yeah i, I would i again i can't speak for it but i would guess it's a similar thing right like yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing that I find very similar between the two, but it quickly strays away is um, when I started skateboarding and what I observed for all my friends who started skating is when you first start, one of the, like, the biggest goals you have is that you want to be legit. Like, you want to not be a poser. Yeah. You want to like dress the part. You want to you wanna have the skills that they have. You want to have the style that like em emulate the style of your favorite pro and takes a while. But the difference being, I feel like writers they know they uh they think they're valid before they are whereas like as a skateboarder you're very hyper aware of the opinions that your peers have on you so you're pretty aware rather quickly that you're not verified yet and it takes a yeah. long time to become so yeah 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 like right like um i don't know what where when one like sort of like goes from being like a toy to like a real writer or something like that but like the same thing with skateboarding where it's like all right if you can ollie up a curb like you're, you're a real skateboarder if you've fallen whatever the um and and then there's like the whole ethics of like who should you know spots like real estate territories like places like where you get up and like who's been there before and how you got there and whatever like i'm sure there's a whole layered like sort of lore history to that that like i don't know if it exists the same way in skateboarding i have like i have questions about that because for me it always seemed like this is my this is maybe I can tell a story about this. I'm not going to name the person, but they're pretty were a pretty well known graffiti writer, um, and you might be able to figure out who this is just through the telling. 
but this is how I think about it. Like, I think skaters share spots. Like we invite you to our spots, you know, with very few exceptions. And in the case of like, maybe it's like, you know, an illegal spot that like, you don't want it to be a bus. You might, you might not want someone to skate there, but you're never going to kick someone out really. Whereas like graffiti, it's all about real estate. And it's all about propriety, like ownership, you know, in some ways, right? Like, I think that's a fundamental difference. Anyway, I'll tell you the story. You got, y'all got time? Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right. So, um, <clears throat> like I said, I grew up in Austin and they're like really beautiful women in Austin. All, I was like, spoiled high school, college. Like there was just like the hottest girls, right? We all had this crush on this one girl, Lila. And, uh, and like, you know, kind of typical shit like in high school where like you and your friends like know a group of girls and everyone kind of dates, right? Like, you know, your, your buddy Patrick goes out with Julia, you go out with Dara and like all these, you know, like they sort of intermingle. And as, as you grow up and get older, like maybe you end up dating Julia after Patrick did. And maybe, you know, Zach ends up with Dara or whatever, you know? And like, for me, that was like a fun, like it was connected to skateboarding and it was connected to youth just being like, all right, like we're, none of us are in love. This isn't serious. Like I'm going to date her. Then my friend's going to date her, whatever. So we all had a crush on Lila. I, and I was the one that like, because I was in LA, I sort of had the advantage of her not really knowing me. So I could come back and try to impress her way harder than like my friends who saw her every day. So finally, my final like time of going back to Austin, I get her, we're dating. We go to New Orleans together. We're saying the L word. We like, you know, she's thinking of moving out to LA to see me. Like I'm like sick, you know? I go back to finish my semester college uh like by spring break when she's supposed to come out to LA to see me she's like no nah, I'm not coming and I'm like what why and she's like you know like I don't know like and I've been I've been talking with her for a little bit and being like yo like what'd you do last night and she'd be like oh me and Patrick went swimming and I'd be like what cool like my best friend and my fucking I see you guys shaking your heads that's some graffiti writer <laughs> uh, my best friend is hanging out with my girlfriend sick you know like dope <laughs> like completely ignorant uh and sure enough, like, of course, like he starts dating her, you know, and I try to be a cool guy about it. I'm like, all right, whatever, like fucking, you know, like we all had a crush on her. He lives in the same town as her. Doesn't really matter. Like, as long as we're still friends, I'm cool with it. Trying to pretend like it's cool. It's not cool. Now I'm no longer his best friend. I'm the dude that was with his girlfriend before him, you know, there's a, like tension, but also we're just getting older. Anyway, fast forward three years later, maybe five, 2005, I'm back in Austin, Patrick and Lila have broken up. Lila's, as far as I know, single. So like, I like hit her up and we like hang out, you know, like spend a week together, like old times. I go back to New York, two years after that, sorry, I told you this is a long story. Two years after that, my buddy and his wife come visit me at this bar, I'm bartending at it in, on Orchard Street. They bring this dude and this guy is giant. He's from Texas. He has a reputation for like beating up Marines. Like he's friends with like, he's like a graffiti writer. And like, and I introduced myself to him or like my friend introduces us. And he's like, all of a sudden he's like looking at me like he wants to fucking kill me. And I was like, and I, and it's like, I've just gave them a round of drinks. You know, this is like, he came in with my best friend. I don't know why there's this tension. At one point he goes outside and I like lean into my buddy. I'm like, yo, what's up with your friend, man? He's like, I don't know. He's like, it's weird, huh? And I was like, yeah. And a couple of days later, he's like, I found out like, all right, what it is, is that he is dating this girl that you hooked up with before him. And I was like, who? And he's like, Lila. And I was like, what? Like of all people, like, you know, I've already dealt in nothing against her either, but like I've dealt with this drama, but it's just like my instinct as a skateboarder is to be like, cool spot, right? <laughs> or something. And, and his instinct as a graffiti writer was like, no one ever should come before me. And you know, like, I'm not sharing, fuck that, you're dead to me. I had to buy him beer after beer after beer every time I saw him. It took years. Finally, like, like I was just like, yo, man, you know, I'm buying you these drinks, right? And he's like, yeah, some old school shit. I don't give a fuck. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, anyway, um, that's, that's, that's my, honor. I mean, that's a specific thing, but I sort of, and I'm probably generalizing, but I do think that like, there's a thing about, there's an ethics to graffiti writing that as I understand it, is very different from skateboarding. And it's about like territory in a way that, um, you know, like 
it's looked down it's kind of whack if you're a skateboarder to like be like yo i did that you know like people do it and i'm not saying like that's what what's whack about graffiti i think that's fundamental to graffiti is like your name you know or you're like mm -hmm. whatever you know your mark let me sound well, like a why man. do you think why do you think it's so frowned upon in skating to give yourself props especially when you're first starting off and like you might be a little kid you might be 12 years old you land a kickflip at the skate park on the hip or something like that and and you're hyped because it just took you so long and so many days and you can't even show your own excitement well you, you can but then you'll be looked at as whatever you know so why do you think that is i think because i don't know it's a weird thing though right like i think okay the short answer is like have you seen what happens to those people get to the, they get celebrated their whole lives? Like they turn into assholes and they turn into burn, burnouts and they start skating for other people's approval. You know, at least for me, like you need to be taken down a couple notches just for a while, you know, like learn to just like not sweat it. Cause uh, it's a performance thing too, though. Doesn't it look cooler when like, like we all get hyped if we see some kid do something for the first time, you know, like I like those videos too, but like, encouraging someone to like self cheer is like encouraging them to sort of like skate for other people's approval you know and that's just like one that's just like whack to be around someone like that and two it's probably whack for them to because the moment people stop approving they're they're gonna have to like rethink why they skate and what they're getting out of it and you know mm -hmm. that has happened to friends of mine it happened to me to some extent like i think it's just like um it's just like being a part of a family, like the runt, you know, gets abused a little bit and they learn to take care of themselves. And it's, it's about the ego, right? Like the less they, you know, the less you learn to express your enthusiasm about this thing that you love doing uh, or the, the way that you got to learn how to be like cool about it. You know, it's about being cool. Yeah, I think abso that's absolutely. I mean, yeah, you definitely learn to not express your enthusiasm. I never thought about it that way. Like, even even looking at people like if you eye them when you when you land a trick that's like yeah, a, no, yeah. a no no you can't oh. even look at the other human being in the eyes or else yeah i mean dude I, that's how i fucking i discovered that the hard way bro like i i was skating in uh wallenberg this like spot in san francisco legendary skate spot in like 94 and fucking you know all of my heroes were there it was like josh kalis maurice key Ben Sanchez, Mike Carroll, fucking Scott Johnson, Aaron Mays is filming, like, you know, JB Gillette, who had just come out from Lyon, who, like, the week before we'd skate with him, he was just, like, fresh-faced kid, like, cool with us, and all of a sudden, he's way too cool, because he's a thousand times better, and he's with the cool guys now, you know, and, like, I don't know, I landed something, probably a back tail, and I, like, looked around to see, because, fucking, I'm surrounded by my heroes, like, I want to, I want to stare at these people, if I weren't skating with them, I'd just be, like, taking down everything that they were doing, and they catch me looking at them and then I'm the fucking butt of the joke for the next 20 minutes because they're talking about me beaming, <laughs> you know? And uh, yeah, it's, that's just the way that it goes. And I'm kind of like, I kind of into it. Like I'm someone who's super interested in like visuality and looking and shit because like as an art historian and someone who spends a lot of time looking at and thinking about, uh, you know, objects. But like with skateboarding, it's like, you got to be cool you know mm -hmm. and i know that cool is subjective i know that there's no universal definition of cool but my definition of cool and i think a lot of skaters definition of cool has to do with like literally what it means it's just like removed a little bit acting mm -hmm. like you don't care you yeah, know i understand um how did you get into art history and all that stuff um well my father was a painter and so i kind of always grew up i grew up around art and shit and like kind of you know like there was always art books or in the house and there was always um artists kind of coming through that was just who my parents were and that was just my sort of life but um I it just ended up being a class that I took in college my first year at, at Occidental in LA and I just loved it I don't know it just seemed like like skateboarding kind of useless you know like what the fuck do you do with an art history degree mm -hmm. but um but I just like knew that it like would add this other level of like appreciation to where I was at. Like I already looked at skate like cities as skate skatable. I always looked at surfaces and looked at spaces and thought about the angles and the beauty of these things. And like in skateboarding, as with obviously graffiti, but like you um you you learn to look in a certain way. 
And if you can teach yourself that like, you, that doesn't have to be the only way, but you have, you have actually like developed a very highly specialized way of like appreciating the world that can be applied to other things. Like it was very easy for me to take what I, what I knew about skateboarding or how I felt about space through skateboarding and apply that to a work of art, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, I, and I always wanted to be a writer. I guess I am a writer. So I, I thought that art would be a really good thing to write about, you know, like I, skateboarding is harder for me to write about than art, even though I write about skateboarding all the time. Um, I have this thing and I'm sure like, I, where I think that like actually the less said about skateboarding, the better, which is ironic because here I am talking about skateboarding yeah, yeah. all day, but, but you know what I mean? Like, um, I think that it's like, if you don't do it, you're not going to understand it. And not, you're not going to understand what I'm talking about. Even if I'm speaking clearly and comparing it to something that you do understand, you won't understand it because you don't do it. You know, mm-hmm. art, I think my definition of art, which is very broad, but is one in which like, you don't have to do it to appreciate it. You can learn, you know, art was made for a lay audience for people that didn't weren't like people were praying to these altarpieces they weren't the same people they were making these altarpieces, you know? So I, I think that like, this is oversimplifying it, but like skateboarding like communicates inward amongst other skaters, it's our code. And art communicates outward hmm. as well, you know? Where do you think being an art historian, where do you think that graffiti will fall in the history books in terms of you know labeling as an art form and do you think one day the generations of the future will will be praising it or do you think you know what what do you think about that i don't know i mean what do y'all think about like graffiti in galleries or museums (laughs) there's a lot of like uh controversy it's been going on for so long in terms of graffiti like real raw graffiti on the streets and galleries if you watch the earliest movies like style wars they you know even from then from the 1970s and 80s they've been talking about how oh you're a sellout you know you know graffiti doesn't belong on canvas it belongs on the trains you know that's like a famous line and yeah yeah yeah, of course I, i don't know i mean at the end of the day a lot of people say the same thing you know people have to eat, you know, people have to survive, people have to make money. And I think a lot of those people that say that maybe they haven't had the opportunity to be offered that, you know, to be offered to be in a gallery to make money, because you can be in a gallery and still stay anonymous, and still be true to your roots, you know, of on the streets and stuff like that. So I think it goes both ways in a way. Yeah, I kind of I kind of would compare it to I guess, uh, back in the day. uh, Back in the day, I'm pretty young, I'm 25. But when I like, me and my friends used to be like, oh, if you skate for Nike or this or that. And I, I guess I could just compare it to that. Like, like MQ is one of my favorite writers and he does uh, gallery stuff. Well, he'll, not, maybe not gallery stuff, but he has his own art shows. And I have never once thought anything but anything disrespectful towards that. I just, just like, he's an OG. He's just earned his stripes. He can do that. Whereas maybe someone like, let's say an Eric Costin can skate for Nike and that's completely like, you know what I mean? Like he's earned his stripes. He, if they're going to pay him a few checks, I've seen nothing wrong with that. And I don't think that diminishes him as a skateboarder, nor yeah. does it diminish MQ as a, as a graffiti writer. Right. I mean, I think like, okay, so like, let's take Style Wars because that's the one that I know about the most, right? Like you have like all these guys fucking is and whatever, like all, you know, Zephyr and I'm not going to name any of like the really ill ones because I'm just, you know, the dude with one arm. What's his fucking name? Like, was case two, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, you know, the guy that was like, King of what? King of style, like that too. Like, you know, okay, so you have this moment where these guys are getting sanctioned walls and showing up on the gallery, uh, in gallery spaces in Soho, right? And at the same time, the city is cracking down. They're like creating new trains that you can't paint on. They're putting the, the tra- old trains behind four you know, chain link or like barber, like razor wire fences with dogs and shit. This is under Koch. And like, uh, they're like trying their best to like legalize and monetize graffiti in some spaces by preventing it for the very thing that it was like its currency, which was being all city, like what a train going to all five boroughs or, or like whatever, like, you know, someone's name being known like in everywhere, right? Through the train, through all this shit. And then you have fucking Cap, right? Who's, who's like not a graffiti artist, 
you know he's like he's like a vandal he's he's about like just like getting his name up over his throw-ups his lucille ball throw-ups like over over these beautiful pieces the pieces are up for like a fucking day a burner and then and then he'll like go over them and destroy them and like i'm much more sympathetic to that approach to it to caps shit because i'm just like yeah like he kind of gets in my opinion y'all could disagree and y'all know much more about this than i do but in my opinion he gets down to like what graffiti is about and it's part it is about getting your name out there there is an artistry it is about style but it is about vandalism it's about like like you know bloody wars it's about more it's about antagonism and you know I, I, in that respect it's also something that you can only do when you're a kid on some level you know like they, they have the style wars follow-up and they have this fucking 50 year old you know 50 year old like cap out in some fucking tunnel out in like you know yonkers or something or white plains and there people are like oh you know who that is like you can still do it and that's cool that's dope but like in the same way for me or costin i just compared myself to costin that's insane but like you know skateboarding only means a lot the most when you're really young you know but it, it it's like it's sexy and rebellious and subversive because being young is sexy and rebellious and subversive and like when you get older, it's just like, yeah, you should get the check, you know? And I think like, as far as graffiti, so that's a long way of saying like, I'm not sure how to, how from an art historian's perspective, not an art critic or like whatever, but like, I'm not sure how it should be historicized, whether we should look at it as um, these things were ephemeral. And this is a, a moment in the, you know, like a moment in time where, where like this had a, like art was redefined and what was considered a canvas was redefined and, and how one made art and how that incorporated branding and all these other things like was redefined. And then it got reabsorbed back into popular culture so that a lot of these people became sign painters. A lot of these people come up with the, like the, the layout of a, of a boutique. A lot of these people become fashion designers. A lot of these people, you know what I mean? Like, I, I think like in the same way that Eric Hassan is a skateboarder, yes, but he's a businessman, you know? Um, I think that it's, it would be, it would be, as an art historian, it's very difficult for me to do that because my, what I study in art like is separate from today's marketplace. And I think that the tension in style wars for me with graffiti and the gallery space is like, does it mean the same thing if it's being sold, if you're doing it on canvas and not on a wall? You know, like Jean-Michel Basquiat getting his ass kicked, like for trying to protect one of the, or like seeing his doors, doors that he just vandalized as, you know, Samo or whatever, like seeing that shit then sold for like millions of dollars without his control. Like that to me pinpoints the um, conflict between like a public career as an artist and the sort of private or at least like a legal illicit career as a graffiti writer, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think luckily it doesn't have to be in a museum. Museums kind of fucking suck at presenting graffiti. So do galleries because galleries are just there to make money. If people can make that money, that's good. But I'm sure that's not like the um, core of their practice, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, Neckface still goes out and vandalizes, you know? Like even he might be art director of Baker and doing all this shit and everyone knows his face and what he looked like you know all this shit but he, he's still out there doing like vandalizing that's dope yeah uh in comparison to um museums and galleries and stuff like that do you think that new york city is becoming a skate park city or will become so within the next let's say 20 40 years because there has been the craziest upsurge of skate parks everywhere like now it's not even a big deal anymore before if there was a new park in the city you'd know about it now it's like it will just slip right under your radar because of how many, and you know, they're obviously doing, they're obviously, the city is putting in skate parks to give people the opportunity to skate places where they won't get kicked out. And I understand where they're coming from, but in the same hand, there is a whole generation of skaters who, when they, as soon as they start skating, park is like the go-to. Yeah, yeah, I know. So uh, I've been watching this loop of Keith Hupnagel, like from like, the late eighties when he's like skating the banks and long Island with Gino and Keenan Milton and all these dudes. And like, it's them skating midtown, you know, 
it's like that those guys grew up skating midtown and shit like in the banks which is a crazy spot and um and i just think like would, would someone like huff would those dudes like have the same kind of impact if they'd grown up with the skate parks that like all these kids have today on the other hand think about gang corp you know like those kids did grow up grow up at the les they learned how to skate there and yet the video like black business they're fucking skating like midtown they're you know like skating the rail in front of the trump building on 59th street at columbus circle with a posse of 20 other skaters like if the skate parks engender that which i think is like the most radical thing about skating in a city right like a crew of 20 skaters deep like dominating that space pushing each other doing shit that hasn't been done at that thing on a real street spot good i do think like i mean shit you know like there were years when i didn't have a skate park growing up but i always wanted to skate a skate park you know we skated street and i believe that street skating is more legitimate than skate park skating but like skate park skate you know skating it's like uh, it's training you know and i and i to answer your question in a different way yeah new york city is becoming a skate park city because it's everything is becoming you know the the the, the skate park equivalent of hanging out is happening too you know like everything is fucking getting for lack of a better word gentrified skate parks are, are the gentrification of skateboarding you know they're like oh let's control it and like, this is where we spent money on this and we expect a financial return somehow. And even if the financial return is just containing this activity. The cool thing about skateboarding is that it's a, also what they don't plan for is an ex, it's exp, exploration, you know? Like you, you skating, doing a, doing a fucking kickflip nose grind at the ledge at LES isn't the end goal of a kickflip nose grind. You do that trick so that you can do it on the fucking bench on water street or whatever you know um so and i think i'm pretty pessimistic about new york these days uh not like the like the people but just like what's going on there but i would think that the good thing about new york historically is that it's always able to do, uh reinvent itself and keep progressing well that sounds so cheesy but like uh that i think that like skate parks won't be the end of skateboarding in New York. They will just foster more skaters to do more shit on the, in the actual city. That's what I hope. And in terms of Instagram, again, there's a whole generation of skaters who are growing up with Instagram as their, their main platform. And they're seeing a bunch of skating that I was looking at some video the other day and I was thinking, yo, if this, and it was getting a lot of uh, praise I was like, damn, if this video was around when I started skating, they would it would have just got shut down. People would have been like, you're whack. Why are you wearing this? Or yeah. why are you like zooming in on a, on something that you didn't even land? It's just like a bail where you look pretty or whatever. Like, you, how do you think that Instagram has been affecting skateboarding? I think it's a, it, gentrifying it. You know, it's 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 re, redefining the quality standards. You know what I mean? And like uh, and it's giving someone a people a very warped view of like what's good and bad. But I think also that that's important. You know, I don't think those lines should be so so rigid. You know, other, fuck man, I grew up in the 90s. It was judgmental, you know, like I was never happy with anything I did because I knew it wasn't good enough, you know? And, and if I had had Instagram, I mean, I don't know if I'd still be skating, but if I had that immediate response from total strangers and approval and critique, uh, I don't know, I mean, it, it I think it would have changed my approach to skateboarding. I don't know necessarily in a good way, you know, but I, but I will say that I spent a lot of time, especially as a teenager, miserable about skating, you know, like loving it more than anything, but just knowing I was like, not knowing if I was good enough or like not having anyone to like compare my skating with besides the videos, which were so few and far between and so far advanced that they were untouchable. Like you'd see a video and you'd just be how the fuck, like, do I get there? You know, and the good thing about Instagram is that like it encourages kind of collapses those hierarchies. It encourages different approaches, different skill levels, different looking skaters. And it goes in weird ways, you know, so like that Burberry Airy shit or fucking, you know, all these like crazy like drip skaters that like don't want to be sponsored and film at the skate park and like film in slow-mo and edit their shit to horrible shit. Like, yeah, it looks crazy to me, but I think like it inspires kids and like damn, I, I wore some fucked up shit in 1988 and I didn't have Instagram to blame, you know, like, 
I think it's it's just kids are dumb and creative and they're gonna they're gonna find like so you know they're gonna find their way through it but but like yeah it's it's corny too for sure sorry go ahead no it's definitely i'm gonna go back to graffiti it's related to that also in terms of instagram because a lot of kids nowadays they can um it's very easy to get notoriety or props from people because you can just post something you can post videos of you doing this stuff and a lot of people they'll say wow it's amazing props you know all over the world you get credit for um you know your stuff but the people around here when they see that on the streets they're like what is this kid doing he needs to stop you know he yeah. he, needs, he needs to practice you know like you can't just be but the thing is is like that dopamine gets to your head and you're like i'm gonna keep doing this keep doing this and a lot of people do it just for that you know for likes and stuff but social media is positive because it can link you with people that can help you get better it can link yeah. you with more you know opportunities you know experiences that you yeah i think it's like um so I was listening to someone describing sort of the way that we react on social media and shit. It's like, if, I don't know, like when I, like when, when I'm driving, I'm like screaming at the person in front of me, right? I used to talk about this, like the difference between New York and LA was like, um, you know, in LA, if there's like an old lady on the freeway and she's driving 40, like you're just being like, fuck you, you fucking bitch, get the fuck off the road. I fucking, you know, like, cause you're speaking in this glass bubble an automobile which is like your sense of personal space whereas like new york for most of the time like if an old person gets on the subway you get up and you give them their seat you know because you have to face them because that's real life and social media to me is like the screaming in the car it's road rage you know uh road rage and dopamine and luckily it doesn't really change real life at least for me i mean in the sense that like sure i'll spend at least once a day someone's going to tell me how much they, they fucking hate me and tell me what a loser i am you know that's fine because like no one ever has said that shit to me in real life you know like no one has said like remotely negative things besides like hey i thought you were an asshole on on ig but it turns out like you're a normal dude you know like that's that's like the most threatening shit I've heard in three and a half years of running a, an account that is like designed to antagonize people. <laughs> so, so I kind of like, it's bullshit. And I, and maybe I can have the perspective of that because I'm older and I like, don't trust it, you know, like I didn't grow up with it. So I'm just like, what is this new stupid toy, you know, like that I'm playing with. Whereas like kids, I think who grew up with it, like who might see like a Burberry Airy video or, or read every comment and get really excited and juiced about it. Like they, that might be their re reality, you know? I think from, I was lucky enough to have that space and that distance where I wasn't so sure what my favorite pro thought about their fucking socks or whatever, you know? Like, where uh, the, the imagination is important. And, and uh, I don't know, I'm distracted because social media. No, um, uh, like, I would just assume that, I, I would hope that everyone has a space away from their phone where they can kind of, like really actually start to think about their relationship with the outside world, you know, because I don't think it's social media. I think that's, a, that enhances it. It detracts from it. It distracts us, but it's not like the fucking, the end all truth. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, something else I was thinking about is you're quoted saying that art in is kind of useless and also that skateboarding is not an art it has like you know it has similarities to it which is contrary to what a lot of people say they say like skateboarding is an art this and that but my yeah. my my thought was um so clearly skateboarding is something that affects the lives of people usually significantly when they get into it it takes over completely um yeah. it introduces them to a lot of their friends and a lot of their experiences music the way they dress and identity Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Same same thing with graph or a lot of these different art forms. <clears throat> yeah. How is this? How is this useless? If it if it has all these uses of pretty much molding your life, is it useless because it doesn't have a practical use? Is that the definition of useless? Yeah, I think utilitarian was what I was going for. Like you know, a painting doesn't make a good doorstop. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like art objects, be they sculpture, or, I mean, I'm also keep in mind i'm thinking of a very narrow range of shit i'm thinking of like conceptual art that you might encounter in a gallery space uh, and have to read a lot about to understand 
I'm also thinking of like altered pieces that you're now encountering in a museum, you know. Um, <clears throat> for me, those things are by definition useless. They're not tools, right? Like you can think, you can approach them conceptually, you can learn from them, but you can't use them to like change a tire. <laughs> uh, and skateboarding is a little more, doesn't mean that art doesn't like positively impact your life. The ability to think metaphorically and to think of things in terms of symbols and to find renewed meaning uh, in one's understanding of an idea as it's reflected in that artistic object, that is like fundamental to like our humanity, I would argue, you know? And some animals use tools, some animals make beautiful things, but I think that art is a way to confront our ideas of the unknown, of death, of leaving like a sort of a mark of your existence in a way that like, I wouldn't say that skate, like skateboarding is left, there's nothing I care more about skate than, there's nothing I care more about than skateboarding. It has left an indelible mark on my life. And, and like, it is the lens through which I see the world. I have to put on different glasses when I'm looking at art and think about art. But like, I wouldn't say that skateboarding moves me in the same way that art does. I, I you know, for me, it's experiential, it's physical. And I know that like, if I'm gonna say that skateboarding is art, then what kind of fucking artist is Nyjah Houston? You know, like, 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 if skate if skateboarding is telling us something, and we're cons and we're considering that message to be the same type of message that art might tell us, it's telling us a very boring and confusing story. You know what I mean? Like, it's telling it it can tell. I think that skateboarding is much more than art. You know, it's not. It's, I'm not like dissing skateboarding by saying I don't think it's art. I think it. I'm like, why does it have to just be that? Like, I know about art. It's fucking limited especially the way that it's seen and experienced now and who gets to do it and who gets to appreciate it and who gets to own it. Like all that shit is a series of like stop signs and speed bumps. Whereas like the fundamental like approach and experience of skateboarding to me has been one of like unlimited possibility and unlimited interpretation. Skateboarding can be musical. It's sonic. It's bodily. It's physical. It's athletic. It's culture it's linguistic you know you can tell you can someone who doesn't speak your language from the other side of the world you can see something about their worldview through the way that they do backside kickflips you know and so so i think that um maybe it's just because i have i'm despite the fact that i've devoted 25 years of my life to studying art history to writing about it to teaching it on a professional level whatever whatever I still know how little I know about art. You know, it's, I'm confronting the unknown when I'm thinking about art. Whereas like with skateboarding, it's like in my like blood vessels, you know, like, and so I, 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 I know what it's not, <laughs> you know? Uh, so I don't know. I mean, it, it's an art form. It can be appreciated aesthetically. Um, it can teach us in the same way that like you, you were asking me before, like, you know, what do you, like how would like a graffiti writer like sort of sustain a career in the arts, you know, would that be possible? I think yes, in the sense that like they take that approach, they, they take, remove themselves from the granular nuts and bolts of what it means to like make marks on a wall. And they sort of think like, what am I actually doing? You know, more conceptually, how, what am I thinking about? What are the issues and how does, can this position towards the rest of the world be expressed in a different way? Skateboarding does the same thing but I don't think that the specifics of skateboarding for me, the way that I understand it, align with my understanding of art making or art appreciation. It's okay to disagree with me though. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I understand what you're saying. It's uh, you're right. Skating has a lot. And also you're looking at art from a different perspective than uh, a chimp like me is like being an art historian. Like you have a, you know, you know, what do I know about art? I just know about MQ fill-ins. So well, like think, no, no no think about it like this like okay you know in this case again I'm just gonna use Star Wars because that's all I know but like you know you have like people like being like why would you write your name on the wall I have vandalism that's ugly you know but like a a graffiti writer already by that point like has like knows the information of like who that is where they're from they can decode whatever words number and numbers are 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 there they can know where that arrow came from know where where this came from. 
know, see the Bode character that like where, where that came from. There's this rich level information that someone who does it, who's in that world can take from it. Whereas like the lay person is just gonna see marks on a wall and they're probably not gonna give a fuck if someone's like, no, actually like, you know, uh, that's Zephyr, you know, and blah, blah, blah. Like, um, like the, I feel, so there's something like, um, there's something, there's a conversation amongst artists and technicians about the making of art and the techniques that I am not privy to as an art historian. I can learn about it, I can read about it, I can have an artist explain to me and that will enhance my appreciation of it. But that doesn't really like change my appreciate, like what my connection to art, you know? My connection is that it inspires ideas. Skateboarding for me, like is about action, I guess. Mm -hmm. Was art the reason you moved to New York or skating? Oh, definitely art. Yeah? Yeah, I, I like, honestly, I'll say art, boredom and privilege. I'll be honest. Like, like I, I wanted, I was in LA. I had a good, I like worked at a bar and I worked, I was skating a bunch and I, I worked at a production company that was like doing like sound design for commercials. I was like making decent money and I was just like, okay, like I could keep doing this, but like, this isn't really what I want to do. I want to be in a city in which art is the industry and culture is the industry and LA is like entertainment and publicity. I want to go. So like art. Yeah. I didn't necessarily, I wasn't sure that I was going to go to graduate school, but I knew that like, I wanted to be able to work in galleries. I wanted to go to museums, perhaps work in museums. I wanted to be in that art world. <laughs> and and like New York was a much more accessible place for me. So like, yeah, definitely like art was that reason. All, but it's straight up like who the fuck, but besides the most privileged, like spoiled fucker, like can be like, yeah, I moved to New York for art. Like what the fuck, <laughs> you know? Like, I mean, I, I was also just young and I wanted I wanted to be, live somewhere cool with dope people. <laughs> you know? How did the historical walking tours come about? Oh. <laughs> did, was that sponsored by like a museum or something or did you make that on your own? And how did you even, find the places to go to where they like personal preferences like how did that even come about i mean that's like a thanks for asking me about that uh that's a fun one because because i didn't grow up in new york i spent a lot of time learning about new york you know like what's great about new york is that you can that that information is aggressively presented to you you know like so you can learn everything you like if you're like oh shit i like that bank on the bowery by canal you know what the fuck why is it crooked you can learn about that you can you can find out that there was a elevated train that went along the bowery and the bank wouldn't have been seen from the front ever because a train cut it off and like blah blah you know and then this, the same architects did that did columbia and you can go down this whole rabbit rabbit holes before the internet you can learn this shit you know so i had already within like three or four years i was just giving my friends and family walking tours and then when i started graduate school um two colleagues of mine were talking about this job they had giving walking tours. And I was like, what the fuck? Like, tell me about this. This is what I want to do. Like I was born to do this. And so, yeah, there's this company called Big Onion uh, that was started by a guy that went to Columbia that hired graduate students to give walking tours. So they would, you, you, you had to take a licensing exam. Like you have to know New York city history in and, you know, inside and outside, up and down. Uh, you get a license, you get your license, you study for that, and then you study scripts that have to do with neighborhoods. Now, every script has like more information than you could possibly know. And there's like a theme. So what you do is you kind of like, you pick and choose the shit that you're interested in. And then as we're all grad, at least everyone that works as a graduate student, we have our own passions, our own interests. So we already know extra shit, we bring that to it. So I, you know, I just kind of incorporated the stuff that I already knew. I definitely thought about skateboarding. I definitely brought in like, you know, like shit like that. If, if that were uh, pertinent to the tour, I would bring that in. Um, and I, uh, yeah, it, it just basically that, you know? And it was like, after living in New York for a decade, I had my code. What are y'all doing? What's that shit? <laughs> uh, I, I, I like knew, I had my own history in New York, right? Like I had my own experiences, my own, you know, certain places had, were, loaded with memories and information and working for a company allowed me to take that experience and my passion. There's no place I love more than New York City and 
also make it official, like give people an informative tour that wasn't about me and my experience. So it was, if weirdly is like the most, that's the best job I ever had. It was me at my most sincere. Cause I was like, and, and t- telling people about New York, you're not like saying like, oh, here's why you should give a shit. It's like, you're telling someone about someone they already love. Like, did you hear what fucking Renee did? And, you know, like, you know how Renee's like this? Well, they also did this, you know? And, and, and they're like, oh, these people hang on to that fucking information, you know? Like that's one of the most exciting things about New York is it's an idea, you know what I mean? Like, um, and so for me, like being a walking tour guide was just a way to find every day a different way to to talk about ideas that are the most important things to me you know that's amazing it's amazing that you were able to do some stuff that you love like that um but you know it it was fun (laughs) what are you doing now for for a job uh so i moved out to california in february and i work retail i got i finished i was teaching and giving walking tours and i've been working in museums and shit and like Straight up, like I wasn't making enough money. I had, I had three or four jobs for the last seven years. You know, like I bartended through graduate school and I was giving walking tours and I was teaching, mm-hmm. you know? And uh, on top of that, like when I finished coursework in my PhD program, I then had the responsibility to like write 40 hours a week on top of everything else I was doing. Mm-hmm. And I got burnt out, dude. Like I, like the last fall was really fucking hard you know i filmed the video part which was dope (laughs) on the upper west side but like i i like couldn't i wasn't making enough money and i was just like miserable and i've been in new york for 18 years and i was just like you know what i haven't seen my fan my mother's getting older i'm close with her i love her i haven't you know like i haven't been with on the same side of the country as my family for 18 years um i had no idea you know like covid wasn't a thing this is february and think about that. And so I just went back to California. I got a job, just kind of some normal shit. You know, I don't have to take my work home with me. I like who I work with. I like the company I work for. But I, I write in the morning and I skate on my days off and, you know, sunny. <laughs> so um, I took a step away from like, like this year, I took a step away from teaching. I took a step away from giving walking tours. Um, I'd like to go back to New York maybe you know like i'm I, but i'm rethinking what it means to think of a place as home mm. yeah. like i think i talked to a friend of mine recently and i'd love to know how y'all feel about this like because he was just like he's you know born in brooklyn and right now he's spending time in kingston with his parents or wherever like upstate and he i was like you know i really miss new york he's like listen i went back home like last week and I miss New York too, you know, because like what I'm experiencing now is not what we experienced six months ago. And I mean, are y'all, where are y'all from? Um, so I was born in Manhattan and I lived in Queens until I was like 10. And then I moved to Massachusetts and then I moved, I would come to and from cause of like family here and stuff. And then I moved back when I was 19 and I'm 25 now. Okay from uh from brooklyn <laughs> yeah so i mean to me look i is there i don't know if y'all know that quote of like eb white about the three new yorks let me read it for y'all because I, I i i i like found it uh so i was thinking about this i was like oh i'm talking with real new yorkers i gotta i gotta have, come locked and loaded <laughs> no he says uh this is from uh here's new york he's like there are roughly three new yorks there is first the new york of the man or woman who was born here who takes the city for granted and accepts its size and its turbulence as natural and inevitable. Second, there's the New York of the commuter, the city that is devoured by locusts each day and spat out each night. He's writing this in like 1912. Third, there's the New York of the person who was born somewhere else and came to New York in quest of something. Commuters give the city its tidal restlessness. Natives give it solidity and continuity, but the settlers give it passion. And I sort of think about it like, I love like there I've lived in New York City longer than I ever lived anywhere else like I hit like I I grew up in Austin and I hit the 17 year mark last year in New York I was like oh shit I'm about to like have spent more time anywhere like here than anywhere else that's crazy you know what am I because I don't think of myself as a New Yorker and 
for me, the way that a lot of my friends who grew up in New York, uh, like hate the, how it's changed, hate like, you know, like wish, like they just see the way it's changed and maybe they're having trouble like affording to live in their hometown. Neighborhoods change, people die, people, people move away, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and I, I don't wanna sound cavalier, but like, I never tried to hold on to it for too long. So I never broke my heart, you know? Um, so like, but somehow right now, especially with like the pandemic and everything, like I just, I mean, I'm with my family, you know, like this doesn't feel like home, but it is home. Um, I, I don't know, I think I, I sort of like, I don't know if I would ever, what I would expect if I ever went back to New York and what I would want, you know? Um, like how, what does it feel like for y'all now? So I have a kind of a short story. So what happened over the weekend was um, I went camping, right? By myself, I got to this campsite. Nobody was there because it was only 30 degrees outside. So I was the only person that reserved the spot on this campsite. Not even the management, nobody was around. I went on my, uh, on my motorcycle to go camping. And the thing is with me, like I've lived in, I was born in Brooklyn, so I've lived there my whole life, you know, and the thing is, is like my mindset has been changing nowadays. I keep thinking that I want to leave. I don't want to stay here anymore because it is changing. You know, I want to live in the woods or something like that. So I go camping and uh, pretty much what happened is I got stranded in the, in the darkness. It got freezing cold. I couldn't make it through the night. Yeah, and yeah. It was, there was an intense fog. It was the night of Halloween. Oh, and shit. <laughs> So pretty much what happened, I barely got it out of that campsite in the dark through the trees. I almost got stranded out there. I was like slipping and sliding on this dirt path on my motor on my motorcycle. Yeah. So pretty much on the way home, I don't know how I got out of there. I was thinking how much I love that I'm riding to a city right now where I can sleep in a warm bed, street lights all around me. Yeah. And, this, and I don't want to be around this darkness. You know what I mean? So it's yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think. No, I, it, I, yeah. <laughs> I think so on some level like what about you like how's it been or what's your position yeah i don't know i mean i feel like my mentality has shifted a lot in the past three years just like with just life in general but i i realize that it's a common theme for people who live here eh, it's like not that common but like at least the people who are around me it's a common theme to be like oh I'm, i want to leave this place this place sucks like look at all the negatives and Honestly, you know, it's just, it's a cliche to say, but the grass is always greener. You always, uh, and there's a lot of good things about this place. There's a lot of terrible things too. You know, it's just very expensive to afford. I guess it really matters what you're looking for out of where you live. You know, some people don't care about living in a place that is known for art or has a lot of culture. Some people don't care about having uh, like like uh, delis at every block. I guess it, de it just depends on what you care about. Um, what was the original question? I'm sorry. I forgot, but I like this conversation. Um, I think I was, I was thinking about just like, I don't know, I, but I, think, I think my question was like, how do you see yourself living in the city and how do you see it changing? Because I'm, for me, my experience of New York was proximity to, you know, I loved the crowded subway. I loved going to the Zay bars or fucking LES or, bars whatever you know like the whole thing especially because i moved there in my mid-20s i was like you know i want to be part of this thing because there's an energy there's a and part of that was was physical you know like touch like not like on some weird shit but just like i like the fact that you're butted up against total strangers wherever you have to go you know and that's why sadly tragically coronavirus hit so hard when it did new york because you no know, that's how people live there you know one on top of the other, 100 people per floor in a building, you know, shit like that. That's why, why those buildings got hit hard. Like, um, but part of that for me had to do with being young and having the energy for it. You know, I live in the Bay Area now and it's like, it's ruthless. You know, you, there's more, it's, I've, I've seen more crack <laughs> on the corner across the street from where I work in downtown San Francisco than I ever saw anywhere in New York City. You know, like I've seen more like crazy urban, like desperation and crime and just like horrific shit, like to, to the point where like, I don't even see it anymore. And I've only been here for six months, you know, at the same time, you see more wealth. I mean, you know, we're in the middle of the dot-com boom in the, in a, 
in San Francisco, it's like, it doesn't, like Manhattan, it doesn't expand. It's a, it's a peninsula, it's seven by seven miles. That's it, you know, can't go up, can't go out. Um, and so like, uh, what am I trying to say? I would have to, I like can't go back to the way that New York was. And I've always thought of New York as like, you know, I got there in 2002, I missed the party. I miss the '90s. I miss the fucking cool ass, how whatever like fucking Mud Club and Andy Warhol and Jean Michel Basquiat. I miss that shit too. And you know what? They missed fucking CBG. You know, they missed like the earlier generation of like Greenwich Village beatniks. And those beatniks missed the fucking 1930s Harlem Renaissance. And the 1930s Harlem Renaissance missed fucking you know the Gilded Age in Belle Epoque Paris. You know, like, there's always some era of New York that was better before you got there. And I love that shit. I love that, that like, like you, you, you it's kind of like being reminded that you ain't shit, you know? Like you can, you can get there, you can feel like, like you, you have the best day of your life in New York City, but you're gonna see someone who's doing a lot worse than you and a lot better. And, I, and for a long time, I loved that about the city. Currently, like I love history, but I don't give a shit, you know? I don't wanna, because for me, like, it was partly about being dope. I was like, okay, New York's full of dope people. It's sick. It's cool. Like, I'm part of this. I'm dope. And now I'm like, I'm 44. I'm, t I'm tired of trying to be dope. Like, it's pathetic for me to just sit here and try to be cool right now. Uh, so I, I don't know. I, I guess I'm just curious. To, I'm, I'm in a period where I'm rethinking my relationship to the city, to New York City, and to my own past, and to what I think of New York as a big thing. And so I guess my question to both of y'all was sort of about just like how you position yourself towards it. And then story about getting lost on Halloween. It sounds fucking terrifying. Like Ichabod Crane's gonna pop out of a tree or some shit. Like, but like also, yeah, I love that about New York too. Like I never was, I was never scared, you know? Like uh, I, I, as a child, I was scared of the dark. I was never scared of anything in New York. You know, I felt like even probably foolishly, I never got robbed, never got beat up, never got jumped, but like, I never felt, I always knew that there were light, there was light, there was electricity, there was people, you know, there are bad people, but there are good people. And those people like were, <laughs> were not worrying about me. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I'd have, to, I would have to really have a good reason to go back. And right now I don't have a good reason. So you I don't, think, as of now, you don't plan on moving back? not for a year you know and i'm not like it sounds so fucked up like think about my my times there and back like 2002 i moved february what the fuck like that's that's about five months four months after september 11th like that's pretty cynical and then i leave i happen to leave like three weeks before the current like that's a chunk of time in which like new york was not in crisis i got lucky i'm i'm the big, luckiest fucking tourist you can imagine but um no, I, I don't know. I, I didn't want to be, towards the end of my time there, I'd been living in the same one bedroom apartment for 12 years. I was like, dude, I could stay here. There's a, there's a 60 year old woman that lives down the hall from me and she's a hoarder. Like I'm her if I don't leave, you know, the whole time I'd spent like hanging on tooth and nail. And then I was like, all of a sudden, like, wait a second, like, this is how these old weird old people that you see like yelling at like a cat on the on broadway this is how they start out you know you think it's like a human tendency to want to leave a place that you've been at for way too long i've, I've heard similar stuff like like you just said i'm her if i don't leave or like my friends in mass would be like oh i don't want to be this person if i don't leave and there's just like this thing where you got to get out of the place that you've been at for way too long even if you're I'm not saying you were doing fine in New York. You said you were working like seven jobs, something crazy like that. But even if some of these people are doing fine, they'll think that, you know, and sometimes I'll find myself thinking the same thing. So you think it's just like a humans just do that out of reaction of needing change or progression or. I think so. I think that like, I know that in my own life, the times that I felt the most happy are when I had the, le when I had the least assurances. You know, like when I was on my own and I was not looking, I didn't have very much with me and I was just like, shit, I got to figure this out, you know? Um, part of 
for so for for me a lot of time in my a lot of my time in New York was living very much on the edge and not having a lot of assurance and I loved it you know but towards the end I was like in my apartment and filled with like 10 years of my shit and I'm being like oh sh like this is this is dragging me down and um yeah I think there's a human desire for a clean break because I think that no matter all the shit that we start to own like fucking cell phones and clothes and shoes and whatever like we don't it's it's all garbage we don't want it like we feel better without it you know and moving is the way to fucking enact that feeling of freedom of being unencumbered by our attachment to the material world and that's you know I'm, I'm not like a spiritual person but i know i've in my research it sort of seems like a lot of spiritual traditions are rooted in that like renegotiating your relationship to the material world you know like um one of my favorite i think my favorite painting in the world y'all should see it before it closes down again is uh at the frick collection it's saint francis in the desert by giovanni bellini and uh it's like from the late 15th century and it's a painting of poverty it's a painting of this like aesthetic uh you know like mendicant saint francis who like started an order of monks who begged for for charity you know and he goes out in the wilderness he'd been a rich man he goes off in the wilderness he miraculously receive, receives the stigmata it's painted so beautifully by this like Italian painter who's like one of the first painters to like use oil paint in Italy, Venetian painter. It's this landscape. It's like you see like, you know, 112 different species of plants, all these animals tucked away, beautiful golden light. And it's painted by the most meticulous, like money grubbing, materialistic, like Venice. Venice is Manhattan. They don't have any fucking farmland they don't have any like land it's canals and and beautiful palaces rising out of the water like and it's all built on trade and commerce and warfare and they paint these like beautiful paintings of poverty because that's what we desire we like we want to live off the land that's our that's our human nature is to forage and to explore you know what i mean and so like i think like that's a thing that's skateboarding right it's exploration for me First, you learn the language, then you learn to move, and then you go places. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no, that talk about um, not having assurance is actually really interesting because, you know, living in the city, having a job, especially a nine to five, it, it becomes very routine. You know, it becomes um, something that you can predict. Like, if you were to ask me where I'm going to be in 20 years on a Tuesday at two o'clock, I can tell you exactly in theory, if everything goes right, I don't, you know, die or whatever. Like I know where I'm going to be. I know exactly what I'm going to be doing and what job I'm going to have. And I don't know that, that having no assurance, for example, when we go on road trips, like for example, we drove to Florida in a car and we had no plan. We would just like sleep in the car, like eat in random places. Or like when we went to Puerto Rico, we, um, we didn't even get an Airbnb or a hotel. We literally slept on the streets of Puerto Rico with no assurances at all. We didn't know if we were going to make it through the night. But in those chaotic moments, that's when I felt the most alive, the most happy, the most content with my life. It's, it's, it's crazy. People think, oh, comfort, routine. You know, after a while, it becomes, um, you kind of get numb to it. You know, I feel yeah, like yeah. those those wild uh, freestyling moments of not knowing what you're going to eat or where you're going to shit or where you're going to sleep or whatever. I think those are in our nature more interesting. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, that's, it's human nature to find order in chaos, you know, and, and the, the best part of life for me, this fuels my interest in art and this like fuels my desire to skate is those moments where you have to actually invent those things, make up those stories, find your way creatively, like, like see those things. And, um, yeah, I mean, and yeah, totally, like I had a nine to five, <laughs> I, I had a very kind of like regular time consuming job at a museum in Yonkers, like for two years before last fall. And it was like every, on paper, it was great. I was like, you know, this is, this is a career in 20 years. I can see where I'm going with this. You know, this is why I studied art history. This is where my PhD is going. I, here's all the, this whole possibility. And I was fucking miserable. You know, I love telling people about my job and hated describing what I did and hated thinking about what I did and hated doing what I did. <laughs> and the moment I lost that job, I remember I was like, I, I just bought a bike too. So I just fucking spent like, you know, 
$500 on a used bike off of Craigslist, something I could have afforded with a full-time job. I'm like giving $500 cash that I'm supposed to be eating off of for the next month to this dude on a bike for a bike. And I'm riding up the West side highway bike path, like back towards my place. And I'm just like, so thrilled, like, holy shit. I get to adventure again. You know, I get to like, this is exploration. This is like me. This is what I missed. You know, this is, and yeah, I, I mean, granted, you know, I'm speak again, I speak from a position of like, I made it out of that. I didn't end up homeless. I didn't starve to death. You know, uh, there were people, I had work lined up and shit happens. Like those moments of freedom, of creativity, of trying to like adapt and like uh, improvise, those, those are only appreciated when the result, the end result, yeah, end, you yeah. don't end up dead, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I definitely think that, uh, I was thinking the exact same thing this whole time, pretty much that it's, it's one thing to have a lack of routine when it's going your way. Yeah, exactly. it's another when you're stranded in the woods and it's not going your way. So it's not necessarily <laughs> the lack of routine. It, it might just be, you know what I mean? Like, and it's also like, let's just say our trip to Florida, sleeping in a car. Yeah, that's cool for four days. Let's do it for four years. Yeah. We'll hate it. You know what I mean? It'll be, we'll be like, we want structure. We want some sort of thing. I'm tired of this dude. I'm tired of that dude. And I hate not knowing what parking lot I'm going to sleep in. And if a Florida, Floridian Sherm heads <laughs> come out of the cut and kill me or something, you know, like it's, yeah. uh, it's just like, but one thing I do think is that humans are not meant to do, even if you love what you're doing, you're not meant to do that thing like 24 seven at the set time and date forever. We're fluid, we're fluid people. We're fluid, like creation. We're yeah. fluid beings. Uh, we're not supposed to be stuck on, st uh, stuck on one thing forever. You know, I, I could imagine if I was a pro skater, you know, I'd be so over it. If someone called me and it's like, yo, 9am, we have to get this. And it's been five years of this already. I'm like, yo, yeah. bro. Like, I did not start skating for this. Yeah, totally. I mean, that's that's one of the ways that, like, I think I've always been able to sustain my love for skating is that, like, it was the, it was never in the cards for me to make it as a professional skater. That was never a goal. So it was always the thing that I, I thought about all day while I was in class, and then I got to do after dinner or after school or before school you know like it was it was the icing on the cake the sweetener it was never the the real thing and um it's still like that for me you know even though yeah like i said like that's all i think about it's uh, it's those it's like in spinal tap when they're asking what he wants to do after if the band doesn't work out and he's like full-time dreamer <laughs> like that's sort of like how i approach skateboarding like i'm doing other shit all day you know I'm writing a, not about skateboarding for my dissertation. I'm fucking working, you know, my humdrum job, but I'm thinking about skateboarding. And so when I do skateboarding, I get, it's fun. It's an escape, you know? Um, yeah, the job, it would suck. Like maybe that's sour grapes. Maybe I was just never dope enough to be pro, but like it would suck to be pro. It would, like I, my friends who are pro or have been pro, like they don't like skateboarding. Like I like skateboarding, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, man. Um, thank you so much for coming on the show, bro. Yeah, well, damn, man, cut me short. But I guess it's <laughs> yeah. hour, hour and fifty minutes. That's that's good, right? Yeah, yeah. No, it was perfect. I really, honestly, we went to some places that I didn't think we were gonna go to, but yeah, it was, it was really good. Dark woods. It was and a pleasure. Dark yeah, thank you, thank you both. That was that was a lot of fun for me. Um, you get your recording and everything. Everything's good. Yeah, Audio? everything is perfect. Cool. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you. Later. Later. Oh, and tell me when it's ready. I want to oh, hear yeah, for it. sure. I got you. I got you. I'll push it on, on my account and all that. Sick. Awesome, man. Peace, cool. Ted Barrow. Thank you, man. There, guys.